I'm Russell Waddell, Bluegrass Outreach Coordinator for the Dry Stone Conservancy. Welcome to this November's detour brought to you by the Bluegrass Trust. Today we're at Lower Howards Creek Nature and Heritage Preserve in Clark County, Kentucky here. And the wall behind me is a wall that we have uh, rebuilt various ways uh, using various means such as workshops, competitions, and certifications. And that kind of encompasses our mission, which is to preserve and promote the craft of dry stone masonry. And we do that by offering workshops to the general public. And we've done some of those here on this wall behind me and elsewhere on this property. Um, we've done uh, certification tests and these, these certification program levels are, are kind of a, um, a, a reference point for experience and are required in multiple states to bid dry stone masonry work, especially here in Kentucky, but other states as well, we're starting to see it come out. And what, what that means is there are uh, rock fences all over the state that may be adversely affected by uh, road widenings and such. And if they happen to adversely affect a rock fence, they're kind of required to rebuild them elsewhere. And so in order to, for someone to rebuild those uh, using state funds, they have to be uh, certified through us. And we've done that here on this wall. Uh, we've tested all three levels um, and it helps support our mission. Also, we've done um, a competition, which was uh, basically 200 almost uh, linear feet of rock fence that we tore down and rebuilt in one day. And you see that in the wall behind me. Um, there are various components of a rock fence. The vertical stones you see stack like books are pretty much um, there uh, to add weight and security to the stones below it. They're called coping stones. And this wall, we've put uh, a cover course below those coping stones and you can see them below those. And then you have um, basically the wall below, which we uh, use various specifications, such as a projecting foundation, uh, projecting tie stones, and such to help strengthen the wall. So uh, what you see here is the realization of our uh, mission at the Dry Stone Conservancy. What you see behind me is my personal favorite rock fence. It is an edge fence and the stones are placed at an angle and you see those on steep slopes, rocky outcroppings, and floodplains. And a lot of times you will see a standard rock fence transition into an edge fence and then transition back into a rock fence. And now we'll go to Wilmore off Glass Mill Road to see a double barrel dry stone culvert that the Dry Stone Conservancy did back in 2007. Now we're here at the Wilmore Culvert here off Glass Mill Road. Uh, what you see behind me is a double barrel dry stone culvert. It was constructed in 2007-ish um, by the Dry Stone Conservancy. And this was done in response to a need to widen this uh, bridge culvert here. Originally it was a timber span bridge and it flooded so often that they decided to raise the roadbed and construct a stone bridge to go over. And that stood to about the mid-century, uh, mid-1900s, where they did a kind of a, um, a retrofitting and it stood for a while. And then back in, say, 2006, a truck ran off the edge of it and kind of ruined it. So they needed to widen the road to two lanes. So we, the Dry Stone Conservancy was approached to kind of um, sort out how to get it done. And we were able to kind of do that uh, in, in response to kind of an experiment to test the viability of dry stone masonry on an active road. And this road is very heavily traveled and 10 years later, the stone is, is still there and standing great. And as you can see, there are just stones with no mortar and they, uh, can't go anywhere and their friction and gravity is the only things holding them together and so what you see is how they would have done it a very long time ago all of the stones you see were kind of shaped in the quarry 
abandoned quarry right next door. So we have stones working together via friction and gravity, and they're unable to kind of move from that situation. So what you see here are maybe 20, 25 stones trying to fit through an area where maybe only 12 stones can fit. And so they cannot fit through there all at the same time. And that's why these stones it holds up to, the, to the, the traffic overhead. So you lay one stone down uh, and then you pack it from the rear to where it doesn't move and you lay another stone and you pack it and you lay another stone. And uh, eventually there's so much weight and friction and if they're laid flat, those stones can't go anywhere. And then when you get to the, the arches, as I said, you have 25 stones trying to get through a 12 stone spot, it ain't gonna happen. So you end up with this lovely bridge that has stood the test of time. There are two six foot long stones in the middle holding both arches and they hold a whole lot of weight. And as you can see, stands the test of time. And now we're gonna go over to the Little Hickman Creek in Jessamine County to look at what you can do when you're a master craftsman. Hi, my name is Seth Thomas and I am on the board of directors of the Drystone Conservancy and have been for about 10 years now. I built a stone planter outside the house I was living at and I got some pointers from an uncle of mine who had taken a workshop with the Drystone Conservancy and he told me to follow up with that and my wife at the time got me a workshop uh, that was taught by Neil Rippingale and I just kept doing different projects, building walls, uh, building arches. Eventually, I was asked to join on some projects with the DSC, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And, and in doing so, I was encouraged to go ahead and do certification through them, which I did, uh, gaining my master's uh, certification in dry stone masonry in uh, 2016, I believe, or 2017. And through, through it all, I've been finding ways and reasons to always come back to building with stone. And so when, it, when, I, when I went to build a house, this place where we're at now, uh, which is in East Jessamine County, that we are actually about 60, 70 vertical feet over top of Hickman Creek. And this is the creek that flows out of the east side of Lexington. I found a spot where you could actually see up the creek. And you, could, you couldn't see as we see now, where you can see this, this big gap, and uh, it was all covered in trees. There were trees all through here. It used to be a cattle farm. What I did first off, in about three years ago, in late 2018, was I had a friend of mine help me um, cut the trees down in this narrow spot. We started at the bottom, and we worked our way up to, to, to cut the trees down. And in the process of doing that, I fell down that hillside many times. And I thought to myself, this would be a great spot to have a set of steps, you know, so you could actually walk up these, uh, this hillside. And um, I thought that would be a great project. And so I knew there would be utility if I built a set of steps from the creek up to my house because I, want, I wanted to be able to access the creek. I wanted to be able to access the house if I was down by the creek. I have kids, and so I wanted them to be able to get to the creek. When I began the steps, I knew it would be easy in the beginning because I, I was able to get the material to the base of the cliff by bringing it in on a trailer. And I planned to have the steps as big as I could make them, um, although they would still be small in uh, dimensions as you, know, you would want to see a set of steps. Really, I could only make them 18 inches wide um, just because of the weight of each stone. And if you're going to do it in dry stone, you kind of need to have the steps be um, single steps. And so if I had had them any wider, they would have been maybe too heavy. And so each step was about 18 inches wide by 16 inches deep and 6 to 8 inches thick. And they averaged about 175 pounds. And so essentially in August of 2019 when I began the steps, I, I lay the first step I roll the second step up on the first and build from there, and then I lay the third step, you know, roll it up the previous two, and so on and so forth. 
And as you can see from the other shots of the steps, that there was a lot to build underneath the steps as I went. Depending on what spot I was in, it might have a wall underneath it that would be a foot tall, foot tall or maybe be four or even five feet tall. And all of that material I had to bring up the hill. And so as I built the steps, I would, I would bring the other material up the hill, carrying it, and then I would roll each step up the previously built steps. And I, got, I think I got to about 40 or 45 steps. It's at the first spot where there's a landing and I built a switchback. And I just kept falling down. I kept falling down the hill as I was trying to build it. And I was getting frustrated and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't as easy to, to make it good quality. And so I eventually started to use a scaffold, like a makeshift scaffold that I built that was two by six feet. And I would just use two by fours to give me just a small platform from which I could build. And so from there, I just moved the scaffold as I needed, as, as I built several steps and I moved the scaffold again. After 60 steps, I decided I was going to build a rail and a sled uh, and fix it on the hill and, and lower stones from the top of the hill with a belay of ice and a climbing rope to where I could then unload them and build from there. And uh, that was cumbersome and, and you know, painstaking and time consuming in its own uh, respect, but it, it did become physically easier, which was key because a lot of it was right at, the, right at the limit of what I was willing to do physically. I continued building the steps up the hill. To get to the top of the hill, um, I think I did about 105 continuous steps. These are one stone on one stone on one stone. And then to the front door, that was 120 steps total. And I finished the steps actually in November of 2020. Some of that time I had to go and get other material. Uh, a lot of these steps, they came out of um, spots where people had dug basements. And then other steps actually came from historic buildings. Um, people would tear down buildings and they would, uh, you know, they put the stones on a pile and it's assumed that at some point somebody might want to use those stones. Well, I love to use salvage stone because I, I feel like some, at some point, some, some craftsmen, maybe 100 or 200 years ago, had worked on, on that material and had uh, d done a lot of things to make it fit right, and, and it was still useful. It just was sitting in a pile somewhere. Once I w got to the top of the, the house and built the steps all the way up, I knew that I wanted something else. I knew I wanted something as a, as a patio and kind of an overlook wall. And that was the second part of this. And that was almost as difficult, not, not necessarily logistics wise, but it was a big undertaking to build what you see here, this, this uh, overlook wall and patio. And a lot of this stone, a lot of this stone actually comes from a historic house that was on Newman Road in Jessamine County. And that house was built in the 1850s, I believe. And I was able to get that stone um, suggested to me by a client of mine and uh, brought it here and built that from November of 2020 and finished it in August of this year. And then after that, I, what I did is I, I ordered split face granite cobbles and uh, built, built, laid a patio on top of it just so that people who come up the steps or go down the steps, that there's this landing that you can, you can uh, stand there and appreciate the view um, that is afforded by this, um, this amazing location. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that I can't put a, a value on the, the opportunity to, to put in something like this. This type of work I could not have been paid to do. It's just something that I love to do. Um, and I, I love to use material that's been used before uh, and, and build something that I know in the future that people will appreciate, they'll be able to enjoy, and they'll be able to recognize as part of our heritage. This type of building is something that we can find in Kentucky and that we can preserve, and uh, it's, it's something that I have come to love to do. I've enjoyed showing you around, and I hope you have enjoyed the November Bluegrass Trust Detour. 
If you'd like to learn more about the Drystone Conservancy, you can check us out at drystone.org or look us up on Facebook.